the mystery of the ascension, the idea that the Lord, at the end of his earthly ministry, after his death and resurrection, spent 40 days with his apostles, on and off, and then kind of gave them this last moment, and then he went up into the clouds. To which you've got to imagine his apostles were like, why does he always do this to us? Because that wasn't the end either. And to grapple with why, why, why do this is almost as deep and as mysterious as why talk through parables? Why teach one set of ritual sacrifices only to replace them with another? And ultimately, we don't really know the answer to any of these questions, and it may, to a certain degree, be unknowable. But a thing being unknowable has never stopped people from trying to guess, especially why the Lord chooses to do these things. A popular opinion is that the Lord goes up in order that he might give directions from a higher vantage point. And... As that is useful for my homily, I'm going to use that idea. Ultimately, uh, God, being all-knowing, does not need to go into the clouds in order to give us directions, right? And I am suspicious that the Lord actually goes up so that he is no longer physically present in the way the apostles were comfortable with. So that they might listen, learn to listen, and act upon what the Holy Spirit teaches them. That being beneficial for the homily I want to give next weekend... I'm not going to talk about that today. You'll have to come back in a week. Why does the Lord ascend? Well, let's let's presume that this is really so that he might stand from a higher vantage point. In militaries, at least in modern militaries, you have generals and you have sergeants, field marshals. And the idea of the general is the general views the battlefield from far away and views multiple battlefields at the same time. So that he might put each army, each division, each branch, in the best position to succeed on its objectives based on the battlefield conditions as they are. And the field marshal's job is that when everything blows up, to give better directions based on the battlefield conditions as they are after the battle has started. So Jesus puts himself in a position to best position us as we go into the chaos and battle that is life. And so, this is not, again, I I cannot stress this enough, this is not God playing games with us. Life and chaos is going to unfold around us. And you can be prepared for that. Or not. You can be in position or you can be out of position. It doesn't need to be battlefield. It really doesn't. It doesn't need to be that dramatic, that intense. Think of sports, right? If a player is in the wrong spot, the quarterback isn't going to hit him. Or the quarterback is going to throw what appears to be the dumbest interception in the entire history of American football. And the reality is the running back forgot what play he was on. Not running back, sorry. Wide receiver, forgot what play he's on, and cut and went in the wrong direction. And the quarterback sees a guy open over there. That's my dude. Throws the ball. He's wearing the wrong color jersey. Out of position. You make a pass. You know, first baseman's not where he's supposed to be. Ball comes hurling in from third base. Guy's not there to catch it. You don't want to be out of position. Here's how we might go about this. We can look at our lives and presume, okay, I know what I want to do. I know what the common sense thing is to do. And often, that is the right thing to do. Very, very often, what is common sense is what what we ought to do, right? And as much as you might look around and see other people struggling with that basic idea that you should do the common sense thing, sometimes it is not the right thing to do. And often we look back, at, we look to the Lord and ask him for permission to do what we want to do. And we get frustrated when God doesn't seem to give permission for the thing that I want. None of us have ever been there, right? We're all awesome. And we go to the Lord first and go, hey, Lord, what will make me happy? 
Instead of, Lord, I know what I think will make me happy. Please make it happen. The problem is, is if you or I really understood the full breadth of reality, that would work. But the reality of the matter is we do not. And most mysterious to us is me. Because we've all done this. I did this, and I thought it would make me happy. And after a bunch of heartache and a bunch of wasted time, I'm not any more happy than I was before. And then we look back to the Lord and go, why am I not happy? And the Lord goes, why don't you listen to me? Again, not playing games with us. But instead, if we might pull a leaf, a page from the playbook of King David's life. Lord, should I pursue this enemy? Well, the enemy's running away. And in the ancient world, when that happens, you pursue them. Because you're going to kill them all and you get to take all their stuff. That's the way the ancient world worked. Lord, should I pursue this enemy? Yes. Good. Go get them, guys. Or no. Okay. Let's go home. That's enough for today. And you may be saying to yourself, okay, well, Father... Um, That's all good and dandy, but I have already solidified my vocation in life. I'm already married. I'm already, you know, 20 years into a career. Or I have a long time before I need to make that decision. Okay, fair. I also think you might want to scale back your conception of what a big decision is. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your energy? I remember very clearly the day I was driving to Homa and I was just passing St. Bridget Church and I was processing some of my faults and failures and my frustration and the inability to overcome some of them. And the Lord very clearly said to me, what if the thing you're trying to get rid of is not the thing I care about? And that's why you're struggling with it. I remember very clearly saying back to the Lord, I'm driving. That is a dangerous and distracting thought. Why would you do that to me? But what if, what if the very vice you think, the imperfection in your life, let's not say vice, the imperfection in your life that you've been struggling with the last 20 years, the reason you're not making any headway is because it's not the thing the Lord really wants you to focus on. Maybe the path you've been going on for the last five years is not the path that's going to lead you to happiness. And it's not that the Lord is restricting your happiness. No. But instead, you've picked a dead end. Now, it takes a lot of humility. This is a scary place to be. As much as it's as scary to, to, to want to change direct course in life is as scary as having to pick in the first place. Now, having to pick in the first place is scary because I might make the wrong choice. Having to change course is scary because I may have made the wrong choice. And I tell you this. In statistics and in strategy, there is a thing that we tend to do that is really not smart. And that's to cover one bad decision with more. I don't want to admit that I made a mistake, so I'm going to endure and keep going as if this was the right thing to do. And let me tell you, whether it's professional sports, the battlefield, business decisions or career decisions, continuing to do the wrong thing so that you don't look stupid in front of other people is really stupid and will not lead to your success or your happiness. So what does this look like? I think it requires first a little bit of repentance and humility. Lord, I've lived my life by my own rules thus far. And I ask you to forgive me for that. And then it takes a little bit of openness. Lord, I know you desire the best for me and I want to be happy. 
Show me the way. Not that I'm asking you to bless the path I've put myself on, but that I want to be on the path that you have made me for. And then here comes the hard part. Step three is, okay, now, Lord, show me. And maybe the Lord will come back to you with silence. Because maybe you're on the right path. Maybe the Lord comes back to you in silence because now is not the right time. Maybe the Lord will come to you with a gentle prod in one direction or the other. A little memory. A a subtle frustration or distraction. And it just kind of nudges you in a direction. Maybe the Lord's going to speak loud. This is an okay prayer. I've done it before. Okay? I want you to hear. This is an okay prayer. God... I need you to tell me what to do, and I need you to tell me loud, because I'm not good at this, and I don't trust myself to hear you if you speak quietly. Or, Lord, I need you to talk to me, and I'm going to go and be quiet at this time tonight, like literally, in my own experience, God... I'm really frustrated that you haven't been talking to me the last three times I went to pray. And at two o'clock, I'm going to pray my holy hour and you're going to be there. That's an okay thing to pray. Maybe not every day, right? Like that. mm, Don't do that. But ask the Lord to show you. And if necessary, ask the Lord to give you the courage to do it, too. Because not all of us are King David. We hear from the Lord and go right away. Most of us, uh, Lord, I need you not only to tell me what to do, I need you to comfort me through it because I'm not going to be particularly courageous about it. But let the Lord show you what direction to go. Maybe there's no change. Maybe there's major change and everything in between. But Jesus Christ went back to heaven. So that he could guide us. So that he could open the way for us to return to him. And that's the blessing he's given us.